Well, good evening. How's everyone doing tonight? Hey, welcome to Dominican University, as well as our homeless youth town hall. We are grateful that you would take time out of your busy schedule to be able to be here tonight, to be able to talk about this important issue. Before we get into tonight's uh, festivities, there's a few folks that we'd like to be able to acknowledge. One, Dominican University, who are our hosts, and I think we need to give them a round of applause for the Penguins, everybody. Tonight, we are live stream on the Community Media Center of Marin as well. We are grateful to the Media Center for all their work and partnership. Uh, so just want to give you a heads up. If you are going to be speaking this evening, you will be uh, live on television, and you are going to continue to be live on television for the next year. So uh, just make sure that you are uh, buttoned up when you come up and speak. And I think we need to give the Media Center a round of applause and say thank you for all their hard work. And we're here tonight because of the youth. In tonight's festivities, this town hall would not be happening with the incredible youth, with the AHO team. And if we can have each of the youth who have been organizing tonight's event to please stand, and I think we need to give them a round of applause, loud and proud right here in Marin County, please. From the, re from the refreshments in the back to ensuring that we have the right speakers in the right seats, we are so grateful for all their hard work. Uh, my name is Mike McGuire, and I'm honored to be able to represent Marin County in the State Senate. Uh, and youth homelessness is a very personal issue, um, as we have some of the highest homeless populations in the entire state of California in our Senate District. Our Senate District runs from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border. And I think that many of us have seen struggle in our life. I know that I saw struggle when I was growing up. Uh, I was raised by uh, my mom and my grandma. And my mom and dad had a pretty bad divorce. And my grandma took us in uh, and got us back on our feet. And if it wasn't for my grandma, we very well could have been uh, one of those families who are living on the streets. And I think many of us have very similar stories here tonight. California is the sixth largest economy in the world. We are number one in job growth in America. And our economy grew by over $50 billion last year. That's the positive news. Yet we have more kids in poverty now in the state of California than we did at the start of the recession. We have among the highest rates of homelessness in America right here in California. And just two counties north of us, in the county of Mendocino, they have the second highest homeless rate in the United States of America. And we also have more kids in poverty per capita in our Senate district than almost anywhere else on the West Coast. And we have some of the highest rates of youth homelessness as well. So being the sixth largest economy in the world, it is simply unacceptable that kids are going to bed hungry every night and that youth are living on our streets. So why are youth homeless? Because of family conflict, abuse in the home, neglect, drug or alcohol issues. Or many times now, it's because they are LGBTQ and their family simply has not accepted them. Some youth are homeless for brief periods of a time, but we also know that there are tens of thousands of youth who are on the streets on average between two years and nine years. The bottom line is this here tonight. California needs to lead the way in providing services for our vulnerable youth. Our communities need to be able to open up their arms to these vulnerable youth. And all data shows the more proactive we are with services, the better the outcome will be for the youth, and candidly, the better outcome will be for the taxpayer. There's another individual who I'd like to be able to thank and turn the floor over to. And this is the woman to my left. Her name is Zara. She runs AHO. There is no stronger advocate to be able to end youth homelessness here in Marin County or in the entire Bay, North Bay than Zara. And I think we need to take a moment to say thank you. She is a force of nature. Uh, and she carries a two by four. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we need to give her a round of applause and say thank you for her incredible work. Turn it over to Zara 
Thank you for helping organize tonight's forum. for the wonderful introduction, Sara. I am so grateful to be here tonight. I'm very excited to be a part of this wonderful cause. Uh, tonight, the AHO youth team of previously uh, homeless young people, served by Ambassadors of Hope and Opportunity, have brought together Senator Mike McGuire, the Marin Office of Education, College of Marin, TAM District, and your Dunedin University to share a new narrative about youth homelessness in Marin. It was inspired by the words of Albert Einstein. A problem cannot be solved by the same thinking and creating it. Since the founding of AHO almost 14 years ago, the Marin community has focused solely on adult homeless, ignoring the almost one third of our homeless community, youth ages 18 to 25. AHO serves youth who have not been in the system, so there are no funding systems like there are for youth with mental illness or for youth with foster care systems. AHO is their only hope to have a meaningful, healthy future so they can contribute their gifts to this community. Stanford study, Connected by 25, reports that if you do not have support they need by age 25, they are 50% more likely to end up homeless as adults. Tonight, we ask you to think different as you learn about the 
growing trend of youth, homeless in our community, how the AHO model is preventative, cost-effective, and comprehensive, and how AHO is successfully serving this vulnerable, forgotten age group in Marin. Hopefully, we can inspire you to get involved in the solution, and we are very excited to have action groups follow tonight's panel, and also questions. Now, I would like to in introduce Anna Pletcher. Anna was a federal prosecutor and the former chair of the Marin Women's Commission. She sits on the Wellness Advisory Board for the TAM Unified School District. She also recently wrote an article about homeless youth for the American Bar Association that you can find at the back table with other AHO information. She will be our moderator tonight. Please help me welcome Anna Pletcher. Thank you. I'm, is this microphone working? It is. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for spending this evening with us to talk about this very serious and important issue in Marin County on youth homelessness. Thank you, Macy, for that introduction. And thank you, all of our panelists. It's really an honor to be here tonight with all of you. I'm going to briefly introduce our panelists, and then we'll just jump right into this discussion, because they're really why we're here tonight, is to hear what they all have to say. Um, starting with our Senator McGuire, who cares so deeply about this issue of homelessness. Thank you, Senator, for being here tonight. Jessica Colvin, who's the director of our wellness centers in the Tamhai Unified School District. Thank you, Jessica. And then our three youth who are here tonight to share their personal experiences and thoughts on this topic. We have Juliana, and Tony, and Christina. And to protect the privacy of our youth tonight, we'll only be using their first names. So let's dive right in and talk about the first of five questions that the youth on our panel have chosen to discuss tonight. They worked very hard on thinking about what are the issues that they would most like to share with the people of Marin County. And we are going to walk through each of their five questions and have the panelists discuss each of them. The first question asks each of our panelists to share their personal experience with youth homelessness. We're going to start with our youth, and then we'll work our way back through Jessica and the senator. So, Christina, would you start us off, please, and share your experience? Um, good evening. My name is Christina. Um, so, you know, problems in my home uh, started when I was quite young, actually, around, well, 14 years old. Um, I had a, you know, family history of substance abuse in the home. Um, both my parents and my grandparents raised me. Um, so there was, there's a huge age difference. Uh, my grandparents are in their mid-80s now, and I'm 24 years old. So, you know, really not much communication in the home. So when I was about 14 um, in eighth grade, uh, I went to Miller Creek Middle School and started having you know, problems at school and, you know, couldn't really talk to my family about it. And um, I ended up getting caught with uh, paraphernalia on campus. And it was actually the first time I had ever been in trouble at school. Uh, I'd always been into sports, got good grades. And, uh, you know, it was my first time getting in trouble at school. Uh, my family wasn't called because, um, you know, my grandparents are monolingual. And, you know, I was just called into the principal's office and I was kicked out of school. I was uh, sent to juvie. Like I said, never been in trouble. So it was a very scary experience for me. And um, after that, I was put on probation uh, and I was sent to County Community School and I was there to finish the rest of the eighth grade. Um, and so, you know, I was, I was 14 years old, going to County Community School, continuation school. Uh, other people who were much older than me on probation. I was actually the only female, so it's just a really hard time for me. Um, and I ended up, you know, getting in trouble, violating probation. And, you know, the juvenile system was just very difficult. Um, once you get on, it's, 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 um, it's very hard to, you know, stay on track. Um, so, you know, after finishing, finishing the eighth grade at uh, the continuation school. I was allowed to go back to Terra Linda High School, um, but under the condition that I would be on house arrest. So 
Here I am starting high school for the first day with my ankle monitor and, um, you know, just still having family trouble and really not being able to connect with my grandparents and really talk about, you know, the issues that were, you know, arising of just, you know, being a teenager and, you know, going through everything I was going through with my family, uh, you know, being addicted to drugs and, um, so I was going to school for about two or three months and, you know, I would have tardies. I would have, you know, problems at home and I'd have to walk to school and I'd be tardy and, you know, my probation officer would find out about the tardy and, you know, I'd get arrested and I'd spend a week in juvie uh, for a tardy and, you know, that put me behind in school. Eventually I ended up getting kicked out of Terra Linda High School um, and that was, of course, a violation of my probation. Um, and, you know, my probation officer and my family at that point just decided that I was too risky to keep around. Um, and I just, I don't really remember speaking to anybody about it at my school or probation officer or, you know, really my family. I just, you know, remember going to court and, you know, hearing that I was this risky child and, you know, that I should be sent away. And, and I was. I, 14, I was sent to a, you know, um, a lockdown facility group home, um, you know, and I was there for about two years. <clears throat> and um, when I came back, it, the cycle just stayed the same, you know, nothing had changed. I just came back to the same family, the same problems, same school, and I really never got anything done. Like, I didn't do any therapy, I didn't do any family therapy, nothing had changed. I just was expected to come back home and, you know, everything was, was supposed to be different. And um, things just stayed the same. And I ended up back in group homes and just, I started being homeless at a really young age, 14 years old, and it never stopped after that. At 18, I got off probation and it was kind of like, you know, good luck. I didn't really hear much from my probation officer or my family. They just said, you know, you're 18 and you're on your own. Um, and my grandparents kicked me out after that. And I had nowhere to go. I didn't have any life skills that I'd learned growing up. My only life skill was, you know, survive and stay alive and you're on your own. Um, so I ended up getting in, into a relationship that was, you know, really bad and I was stuck in that for three years and um, when I got out of that same cycle and um, really just being homeless most of my life and the root of the problem was just the family dynamics They're, they just weren't there I didn't have that support and um, that's the biggest struggle for me today um, just never having any adult for that matter. Um, and there were some really, a lot of adults that I was working with um, to kind of, you know, lead me in that direction at a very young age. Um, so yeah, it started when I was extremely young, um, 14 years old, and um, lost my home. Christina, thank you so much for sharing these stories. These stories we're gonna hear tonight are all very deeply personal and it takes a lot of courage for the young people who are on the stage tonight to share like this. And I just want to acknowledge that for a moment, how courageous they all are. And you'll hear you know, Tony and Juliana as well. So do keep that in mind. And it's, um, we owe a lot to all of you for sharing like this with us. Thank you. Um, Tony. Yes, yes. Um, I've had a, I've had about seven to ten years worth of homelessness. Um, I, uh, my parents got divorced when I was about five or six years old. Um, and then uh, the court split my brother and I up. I have a younger brother, 13 months younger. And then um, I stayed with my dad. My brother stayed with my mom uh, for six months. My brother got switched schools because of a learning disability that wasn't really a disability at all. And then, um, and, uh, I uh, started seeking out um, escape from I didn't know what, but I ended up becoming homeless. Um, and I dropped out of high school when I was 16 years old. And um, that's when I started doing couch surfing and sleeping in cars and on the street or wherever and 
places, houses that would hold parties and stuff, and then I was introduced to a, um, a different kind of lifestyle by not um, going to school and hanging out with um, guys and girls that were older than me, and they didn't have to go to school because they already completed school. So, um, and then that also led to, uh, to drug addiction for myself and then um, some criminal behavior um, that I ended up uh, going to jail for and then um, found myself in kind of a downward spiral uh, cycle of uh, homelessness, uh, getting caught for a crime or some sort of um, uh, something that would come out of some sort of drug addiction. Um, yeah, about seven to ten years worth of uh, homelessness. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Juliana, would you share your story? I experienced homelessness for almost two years. Um, I came from a single mom. I graduated from Drake, and I went to college, and my plan was to go for four years and get a bachelor's in youth ministry. But um, in 2015, I got into a relationship that was uh, really abusive, and I left college and I moved in with her and her mom, and I found myself stuck, um, not able to get out of that relationship. And um, I battled with that for, for a long time, um, in and out of it. And through that, I lost all my uh, family support and friends. Um, I left that relationship to come essentially back to my mom's house and the first thing that she told me when I knocked on her door was, don't come by here. If you do again, I'll call the police. And um, I didn't know what to do at that time. Um, I had an aunt who stayed out here. And my family dynamics, extended family, is not any different. And she lives with my grandma. And my grandma wouldn't let me in her house. And so I stayed about two weeks sleeping in my aunt's car um, in December and it was very cold and I never experienced anything like that before. Um, there were points in time I would wake up in the middle of the night and scream because I couldn't breathe. Um, I never thought that that would ever be my life and it was. Um, I then was able to get um, kind of steady housing at some point. My church stepped in and let me sleep in the church basement um, and that's how I got connected with Zara. Um, but through that, I was still in and out of the abusive relationship and uh, found myself just, again, back on the street uh, until finally I was done with it. And I had a friend who stays in Novato, and I knocked on her door, and she wouldn't let me stay with her. And so that night, I had to spend the night um, out on the bushes off Roland Boulevard. Um, just had my backpack and myself and I found myself just laying out there. Um, it was September and it was pretty cold still. Uh, I didn't think it would be that cold. But um, yeah, just really bad uh, family dynamics. My mom was pretty incapable and still is about helping me out. Mm, thank you, Juliana. Thank you all, all three of you for, for sharing those stories. Thank you. Now, Jessica, as the wellness director at Tam High Unified School District, what have you seen or what do you see as your experience with the youth homelessness in our schools? Yeah, so um, I'm the wellness director for Tamil Pius Union High School District, and we're working to put wellness centers in each of our schools, and the wellness centers offer health, mental health, substance use and abuse, and sexual health services for teens, um, and our goal is to widen the safety net for students and for youth, um, and meeting Zara was really inspiring, and I've actually sent a few kids to Zara um, who have come th to the wellness center through our program. Um, I've spent the last 20 years working with teens in the Bay Area, and I actually started my career in San Francisco at the Huckleberry House, which is a runaway and homeless youth shelter. Um, I also worked at, um, in a group home as well as residential treatment centers, so I've kind of been on the other side helping to support the youth. Um, and in that work, I kind of decided I wanted to make sure that not only was I offering interventions, but I wanted to be able to do prevention and education. And so my work by bringing wellness centers in the schools not only offers direct services, but we do prevention and education. So um, I think that getting the word out to as many young people as possible that resources and caring adults are available to them is key. 
and um, I'm really interested in learning about how we as a community can prevent youth homelessness in Marin. Thank you, Jessica. Senator. Thank you so much. So we'd like to talk uh, personal experiences with the homeless youth, uh, and I'm gonna focus in on some statistics that we see statewide. Um, as originally mentioned in the opening, our Senate district, seven counties, a million people. From the Golden Gate Bridge to the Oregon border, we have some of the highest youth homelessness uh, in the nation. We also have some of the largest populations of Native Americans in the nation, in our district. And we take a look at uh, Native American populations and challenges economically, that drives as well. California in general has the second highest minor homeless youth population in America, those who are under the age of 18. And can you imagine trying to be successful at school and not having a place to call home, let alone not having a square meal each day? Two thirds of California counties, two thirds have no shelters for homeless youth. California overall, 28% uh, of America's homeless population call the streets of California home every night. Yet, we only receive 11% of the federal funding. And in this latest budget, this funding could potentially be cut in half across the nation. 88% of homeless youth report experiencing physical, emotional, or sexual abuse prior to becoming homeless. And what we know is that California needs to lead the way when it comes to providing services, which we'll talk about here in a bit, uh, and an upstream pipeline to prevent youth homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the Senator touched on some of the root causes, as did some of our panelists, the root causes of homelessness, which brings us to our next question. And that's why. Why do we see so many youth homeless on our streets today? What are the root causes? So to put a personal face on those questions, we're gonna ask our youth what, in their view, are the key root causes of youth homelessness? So let's start with this one with, um, with Christina again. I'd say the, um, the root of the cause of youth homelessness I mean, in my opinion, and for me, um, is lack of parental support. Um, you know, I, I didn't have my parents growing up. I, my grandparents raised me since I was about three years old. So, um, you know, my family struggled with substance abuse, so there wasn't much family support. Um, and really just having to raise myself um, I didn't, you know, I wasn't taught the basic life skills that, you know, parents would, would teach their teenager getting ready to go into adulthood, you know, it was really just, you know, focusing on survival and, you know, trying to get to the age of 18, you know, to prepare myself for, you know, I didn't even know what at the time. Um, and, and that was a big thing for me, um, and, I, and I see that a lot in my peers. Um, really no, no parental support and not very many, you know, adult role models in their life. Mm -hmm. Tony, do you have some thoughts about the root causes of homelessness? Uh, yes, yes. Yes, I do. Um, so, um, like, uh, like family, lack of family support or parental figures. Um, that's definitely something that uh, I have personal experience with. Um, my parents divorced when I was really young. And then uh, I, uh, I got to uh, experience a relationship uh, unique with my father. And I got to see how um, emotionally draining the courts and the whole divorce process was um, to where like, my, my dad wasn't like physically, he wasn't physically present for me. And um, that kind of like opened up the, the doors to that, that new lifestyle that I discovered as I was dropping out of high school. Um, and because 
like I gave the attendant's office number for my dad's house. My dad wasn't really like picking up the phone or anything, you know, so like dad didn't know and I thought I had everyone fooled for a while, but really I was fooling myself. Um, and then uh, jail systems. Um, so I found myself uh, uh, in, in that criminal lifestyle, um, committing some crimes. And um, the, the thing that's uh, most key in this context is the drug addiction that I, I came into in that lifestyle. Um, and uh, when I'd go to seek out help and stuff, uh, there, there was like a checklist of things that I didn't have. Like I didn't have mental illness. I didn't have like the things that I wasn't a felon yet, you know what I mean? Like I couldn't get certain resources or certain aid because I wasn't, um, I didn't have those things, but I knew that I needed help. Um, so that just kind of contributed to this uh, cycle of like things being all right, being homeless. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Juli Juliana, do you have thoughts on this topic as well? Yeah, so um, no family support, I think, is the, the biggest one. Um, in my family, uh, like I said, um, I was raised by a single mom. I have a younger brother who's five years younger than I am, and we both have different fathers, and um, that played a big role in um, my relationship with my mom because my brother's dad was around and mine wasn't. And so she kind of favored towards my brother when I was growing up. And I think that um, she had said that like my father was abusive to her. And so when she saw me, I think in my relationship, she just cut me off. And I don't think that she understood what that meant when I was like really needing her at that point in time. Um, and I don't think that she really today even understands the, the amount of like stress she put on me um, and hurt that she put on me that you know, I, I can't ever forgive her. I try to, but it's hard. And now she has some things that are going on with her and she wants me to be there for her. And it's kind of hard for me to do because she wasn't there for me. And my aunt, her sister stepped in when I needed help the most. And so I think it's hard for me to really say that there's the biggest thing is, is family. Cause when there's no family support or even friends or anything like that, you have nobody but yourself. And then um, I found myself not trusting other people and just relying on myself and not even wanting to, to be around others because of what I had come home to. Um, did one of you want to speak to, to the point about dropping out of school and the impact that that has on youth homelessness? Um, Juliana or <coughs> Tony or Christina? Christina yeah. yeah, I can definitely speak on how difficult that is, um, you know, being part of the juvenile court system, you miss a lot of school, you're going to, you know, so many different schools, especially if you're, you know, being placed in group homes, and, you know, that is definitely something that I'm struggling with now, you know, I'm trying to, you know, I got my GED, uh, you know, going to, you know, community college, and that is definitely one of the, the biggest struggles for, you know, homeless youth is, do you take a job or do you go to college? And, you know, and how do you afford the cost of living in Marin County if you do decide to go to college? So, you know, part of being in the juvenile court system and, you know, missing school is that tough decision. Do I go back? Is it for me, you know? It's, it's a tough decision. Um, Jessica, did you have any thoughts on this topic? Yeah, I was just gonna mention two other reasons um, that I've seen. One is the hidden epidemic of um, Marin County parents and adults binge drinking and using drugs and alcohol themselves. And some of the homeless youth that I know have parents that are abusing drugs and alcohol and are not able to care for them. And then the other track that I've seen is um, that critical transition into adulthood when kids turn 18 and they don't feel prepared. So um, a lot of the life skills that's, that young people need um, are often not being taught in the school. Um, and so um, kids are not ready to become adults. They don't know what that means. And I think a lot of young people um, have the risk of becoming homeless when they turn 18 if their parents aren't continuing to support them um, and they don't have the life skills or the job skills or the academic skills they need um, to survive. Mm -hmm. uh, Senator. 
Thank you. I'll, I'll just mention two, two other items very quickly. Uh, one of the reasons why we're also seeing an enhanced number of homeless youth is um, becoming better, we're doing a better job at counting and tracking homeless youth. Um, it can be very difficult because homeless youth are often mobile. Um, but state law now requires, when we do our point of time count, when we do an annual homeless count by law in all 58 counties, we must focus on youth under the age of 18 as a very specific category and we have to focus on youth 18 to 24. The other challenge I think that we have and why we've been seeing some enhanced numbers over the last two years is because we do not have a robust system when foster youth age out of the foster care system here in California. We have approximately 63 to 65,000 foster youth uh, at any one time in California. And at the age of 18, we're supposed to have a robust level of services for aftercare. And in many cases, those foster youth simply have to pack up their bags and leave their foster parents. So I think that's another really significant challenge that the state is going to have to address of providing those reentry services, whether it's getting into school or job skills or, frankly, life skills, how to be able to balance a checkbook or uh, having access to government services when they turn to age 18. And I think that's another really significant issue. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Um, the next question goes to the barriers that homeless youth face. Youth in particular face some very difficult challenges. Let's start with Tony, if you don't mind. Tony, would you talk about some of the barriers in your experience that homeless youth face in addressing the challenge of finding stable housing? Uh, yes. I, um, so uh, something with... Um, Something I found in seeking and obtaining employment is that uh, personal hygiene is really important and also having a, a mailing address is really important and being homeless, uh, those uh, things don't really exist. Um, and if they do, then they're, they're kind of makeshift and um, that the evidence is that the job doesn't uphold itself for that long of a period of time. But um, uh, having an address is, uh, for mail is definitely a big, um, barrier that I found um, in receiving um, uh, government aid and in receiving employment or anything else really. Um, there's uh, also um, uh, the biggest thing um, to give credit that I have to AHO and Zara would be um, the, how immediately I was met um, is that the very same day that I reached out for help, within hours I met Zara and AHO, and Zara pointed me in the direction of the housing and the house that I live at today, um, which is comfortable for me, and it's good living. Um, so a, a time schedule is, uh, is really crucial. Uh, she met me immediately, and I've missed appointments at welfare office for food stamps. I've maxed out the times I've gone to the food bank. Um, so I've actually been turned away um, from getting food um, so, uh, I, I, I think time is, uh, uh, when someone asks for help, like when I ask for help, it really, really warms my heart and I will, will forever remember how fast, um, Zara met me that day because, uh, the, the cycle of homelessness, like, it's kind of like, um, like with post-traumatic stress or something is that, uh, like, I don't know what exactly I'll be reacting to at first, but then, like, I end up finding that it's based on some sort of traumatic thing I've had happen to me in the past, so my body is actually reacting to that. Um, my living situation before I moved to where I live at today um, was feeling constricted, and I was, um, um, by the grace of God, if I didn't have the, the strength to reach out that, that moment, then it could have been... a uh, a continued cycle of the last seven and ten years of my life. Um, so, uh, thank you. Thanks, Tony. So, having that immediate support was really critical for you, right? Yeah, thank you, um, Juliana. Some of the barriers that you faced and potential solutions as well. So, um, a big barrier that I faced was being able to um, get to work on time. I don't have a car, and so the buses is. Slang that I rely on, um, but 
certain places that I was staying, I would have to like say take the bus like an hour or two hours before I'm supposed to get to work or arrive to work late. And um, it was, it's really hard. And um, right now um, I was able to get permanent housing through Zara's AHO um, housing fund. And I live in Novato and I work down here in San Rafael at Safeway on B Street. And so I still like ha face the bus of having to leave an hour and a half early, say, depending on what time I start, just to make it down here early versus being late by 20 minutes or something like that. Um, and that's a, a big struggle for me. I take it as it is, but it's, um, it's still hard, especially when I was on the street and didn't know like where I was gonna be that night and trying to figure out how I'm supposed to get to work um, was really hard for me. Also, um, mail was an issue for me um, when I was, my mom had still had my permanent, that was my permanent mailing address. And when my mom would get mail at her house, she would send me a text and she would have it just sitting on her windshield of her car. She wouldn't interact with me at all. Um, and, and Zara has a PO box that uh, you can receive your mail at. And so it was really nice for me to know that, that I can have it sent there and I would have no issues. Um, Zara will meet you anywhere that you, you can get to and uh, she'll be able to give you your mail. Wow, yeah, the mail is, is critical. Something I think it's easy to forget how important that is. Uh, Christina. Um, one of the barriers homeless youth face, I would say, is a lot of the programs have these, you know, time limits or cutoffs, like, you know, for example, if I'm in a, in a program for school, you know, I have, you know, that semester to accomplish, you know, or I have to have a, a 3.0 or, or a 3.0 GPA or else I can no longer, you know, get the support. And, you know, for someone who doesn't know how secure their housing is and you know I also have a three-year-old son and I'm working and you know I'm I'm really trying to you know sustain my housing um, because thanks to AHO I was able to you know get an apartment near my son's school but I'm also you know trying to go to school myself and and work and sustain that housing um, so you know when I have this pressure of, you know, I'll, I'll buy you your books and, you know, we'll support you through college, but you have to, you know, be able to have a 3.0 GPA. I mean, the barrier is that, you know, myself and some of my peers are dealing with, like Tony said, some sort of trauma and, I mean, definitely anxiety from being homeless or trying to, you know, stay and live in Marin County where you went to school and grew up and, you know, the cost of living. So I think one of the biggest barriers we face is trying to do, you know, the everyday things that are expected from us while dealing with anxiety and trauma and everything else that's going on in life. Yeah, yeah thank you. Um, Jessica, did you want to add anything on this point? Um, I was just gonna say, um, that we're talking about youth. So like youth are just learning um, as young people. We're talking about ages 14 on. They're just learning how to navigate the world and um, connect with themselves, figure out who they are. So if you can imagine being 14 years old or you know, 17, 16 years old and not having a home, it's a basic need. So I feel like without that basic need, it's pretty much impossible to focus on school, to get yourself to appointments, um, you need that foundation um, to be able to be successful. And then we're asking young people, young adults, to be able to navigate these systems. That's why I'm so thankful for Zara, because um, there's not a lot of resources. And giving a young person a phone number is not really helpful. But when you tell them that Zara's going to answer on the other line and it's one person to talk to, is very unusual um, in the systems of support that I see. Um, young people, I really believe in warm handoffs. So if I'm going to refer a young person, I make sure they get there. And I make sure that they made the connection. And if they didn't make the connection, I'll make sure they, get, they make the connection with somebody else um, because they're young and they are just learning. Um, I certainly didn't know how to navigate social services or human services when I was 14. Um, and if I didn't have a roof over my head, I can't imagine that I would be able to focus to be able to get to where I needed to go. So I think that 
one of the huge barriers is just the age and the, um, you know, where they're at developmentally. Um, their executive functioning as a young person isn't fully developed till you're 25. So um, we're asking a lot of these young people and we need to be there to support them along the way. Thank you, Jessica. Senator. I'm gonna take a big picture view of I think some of the challenges that we see across the state. I think number one is the lack of services because of a lack of funding. So again, California is 28% of the total homeless youth population in America, yet we only receive 11% of the funding. And that funding is potentially at risk here coming up in the next fiscal year. I think the other big item is that homeless youth are disconnected from the full range of services that we see. For example, if you're a homeless veteran, you can rely on the Veterans Administration for housing and for services. If you are a homeless, a chronic homeless resident, you could turn to the county for support. These youth cannot. We talked about two thirds of California counties don't have shelters dedicated to homeless youth. Well, less than half, county, half of the counties in California have direct services for homeless youth. Meaning that you walk into the door of a county health and human services, they can't help you. Um, the reason why that is so galling is that 50%, 50% of homeless youth have some serious mental health issues. Um, and there are, in many areas of our state, zero services. So I think where we really need to be able to focus is a dedicated funding source for homeless youth, permanent housing, the federal definition to be able to get services and funding for homeless youth, extremely rigid. And what we know is youth are pretty flexible uh, and they don't fit in one definition. So even though we get that $11 million, we can only spend it in a very specific way. And we need additional flexibility from the federal government side uh, to be able to invest in programs like AHO who are results driven. Thank you, Senator. The next question goes to what's at risk? Why is it so important to invest in homeless youth, to invest in this population while they're young? What happens as a society if we don't? And I'd like Zara to put up the next slide because it really makes a, a compelling point. This is a slide from the 101. Right, that puts it in sharp relief, doesn't it? Um, I'm going to ask Tony to share his thoughts on this slide. Uh, yes. Um I've, I've seen this picture a few times, and the, the most recent time that I saw it, uh, it really hit me. Um, not as like places to be, but like as far as like direction, that there's one, one direction to San Quentin, and there's a million, billion things that could happen in that direction, and then there's another direction to College of Marin, same thing in that direction. Um, but the, the path to, to College of Marin, or the path to any college, is, is gonna be more so on the enlightening side um, from my experience that I found, rather than the other, the other avenue isn't that enlightening. Um, and Tony, could you share your sort of personal experience of what you're doing right now? And I'll ask the other youth to say that as well, because it really relates to this slide. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so um, September of last year, um, I went to jail, I was arrested, um, and uh, I got released uh, February 17th. Um, when I went into jail, I didn't have like courtroom etiquette. Um, I didn't have a good understanding of the law. Um, and I was struggling with representation. Um, and I was going to trial. Um, anyways, uh, I was surrounded by men in jail that helped educate me. And, um, and I was able to properly defend myself and not accept a deal. They wanted me to go to a state penitentiary for three to five years for a charge that I did not commit. Um, so I got out of jail um, with no clothes, really, just my shorts. They actually took my shirt and my shoes, and it was raining, and I had a paper bag, and I got to stay with my mom uh, that night, and then I ended up finding a, a place in, in, uh, in San Rafael, and then now where I currently live. Um, but uh, how much faster and how much simpler it's been with uh, my endeavors in going to college is that I've always wanted to go to college, but I haven't really had like the kind of like stable housing or, or support um, to go to college, uh, and now I am, 
going to school. And with that ambition, and without that ambition, I wouldn't have met Zara, and I wouldn't be here right now. So. And you're going to College of Marin. I'm going right. to College of Marin, there yes. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Um, the next two, the next slide goes to Juliana and Christina because I know both of you put some effort into understanding what the financial cost was of focusing on prevention versus incarceration. So, which one of you would like to speak about this, Christina? Um, so, we did some research while, you know, getting prepared for this forum. And we found that um, when we focus on prevention, we can save a whole lot of money. Um, so to house an inmate in Marin County Jail, it costs a total of $78,000 a year. In uh, San Quentin State Prison, it costs $75,560 a year. And um, AHO's uh, funding costs $1,000 to support one youth for a year. Thank you, that's, that's very sharp distinction. Thank you for doing that research. Um, before we go on to Jessica and the Senator though, I do wanna give Christina and Juliana a moment to share what they are doing now because, because they also have some success stories to share. Um, Juliana, do you wanna just share what you're doing with your work and your housing situation? So um, I've been working closely with Zara for about a year. Um, I met her when I was sleeping in my church. The murals that you see right here were actually um, displayed in my church in San Anselmo. And um, I started immediately working with Zara. I met her within 24 hours. I uh, needed a cell phone and I called her on the landline, which is on the card that she gives out. And she answered it and she said, I never answer this. You're so lucky that you caught me. Um, and so the next day I was meeting her at Aroma Cafe in San Rafael and um, I told her that I wanted leadership experience because that's kind of what I want to do with life and um, I immediately found myself planning on her youth team and stuff and spearheading things that I had no idea I would be a part of um, but it was a, it's been a great experience. Um, I was also able to get a job at Safeway in San Rafael. I've been there for a year and about a month now. Um, and I am a manager, um, and I got stable housing back in April, and the AHO fund was able to help me with my deposit and first month's rent. Fantastic. Um, and Christina? So um, AHO's housing fund actually was able to get me back here in Marin County. Um, I was staying in Roner Park, and I was commuting uh, to College of Marin. I've been working at College of Marin for almost two years. I've been taking classes there, and you know, when I spoke with Zara, I told her my ultimate goal is to come back home. I want to, you know, be close so I can be more involved with AHO, and there's so many other things that I want to do. And commuting is just, you know, it's taking a huge toll on my quality of life and we worked on it together and I was able to get an apartment right like two minutes away from my son's daycare um, and since then everything has been going great. My son is doing excellent at his daycare. He's in the car for a total of like five minutes a day and, um, and I just been able to do what I wanted to do, I'm more involved in my community. I've been working on this project uh, for five months with Zara. Um, I'm also on the board for Marin Casa. I'm still taking classes at College of Marin. Uh, I work part-time at the ESL office, and I actually, I just got a job back at uh, a nonprofit I worked at in San Rafael that is Bloom now, and I'm the assistant manager, so it's um, really excited to be back in Marin County, and um, I really have AHO, and it's 99 member alliance partners to thank and um, it's really a great community and everybody that's helped me in this program is actually in the audience and that's why I feel this program is so successful because we're a family. So, yeah. Can we have a round of applause for everybody for their success? Thank you.
I do want to get back to the Senator and Jessica for thoughts on anything else on this topic. Okay, good. We're ready to move on to the last question, which goes to what opportunities are there for youth and in homeless youth to get involved in driving the policy decisions? One of the issues that the youth team felt was very important to get across tonight was that many programs are developed by adults and not necessarily with the youth voice incorporated in the process. And these youth want to make sure that they have a voice in it and that the youth of our community can take a part in choosing the direction that our policies go. So I would like to ask each of the youth who have been so very involved in leadership to describe what, um, what they have done to bring their voice to the table and then speak to Jessica and the Senator about how youth can get their voices heard on this topic as policies get developed. Christina. Um, so getting my voice heard and being part of the you know, youth team projects and everything has really been part of me sustaining my housing and more than what maybe even Zara might know. It's been part of my healing, being able to share my story and you know, feel like I'm you know, a voice for my peers and the people who are in a position that I was in has really um, helped build my confidence and is really the reason why I'm here tonight. I'm really excited to share this with everyone um, and I've done a lot of projects that have really helped with my healing and towards my success and some more recently. Um, even this Friday, I was um, at a um, forum for sex trafficking with Zara and it, um, it's really important to me to be able to go to something like that, and it's it's any walk of life. AHO can help anybody. It can can support anybody from any background because the plans are personalized. The youth are part of the council. We're right there by Zara, making decisions. And you know, I've done so many things with Zara that you know I never thought I'd be doing. I mean, going to meet with the senator and you know, meet with judges and you know, be part of this forum and speak at a sex trafficking forum, some things that I, I, I never thought I would do. And you know, going to Macy's school, inspiring her, and you know, she inspires me, but you know, everyone, everywhere we speak, they say that we inspire them. And um, it's, it's a really good feeling. And Zara's program, the narrative and the way that she includes us in all the decision making is, I think, the best motto, and I think that's why it's so successful. Yeah. Thank you, Tony. Did you want to share your leadership opportunities? Uh, yes. Um, uh, met with uh, Senator McGuire um, about four or five months ago to plan this, um, which is amazing. Uh, I mean, like this, like being here, being being a being a part of this um, is really something special for me. Uh, like I had, like I'd be like, a, I'd be like a leader on the soccer team and stuff when I was like younger and stuff like that. But this is a, this is a, kind of similar but a lot different. <laughs> um, and it gets to actually, you know, transcend not just my voice but the voice of um, hundreds and thousands of uh, youth that are struggling with this kind of thing, so. Thank you, Juliana, your leadership experience. Yeah, so right from the beginning, I've had leadership roles with Zara. Um, I plan, I was on the leadership team for a couple Youth Connects we had. Um, I've been able to also go out into the community with Zara and speak with her about AHO and my story and my experience. Um, I spoke at Novato High School um, I spoke at the Tiburon Rotary, uh, the Marin Women's Club, W. Bradley Electrics, um, and then I was able to help plan this forum. So just a lot of awesome experiences that I would have never imagined I would have been a part of. And um, it's all because of Zara. Uh, she's just incredible. You work so closely with her and she just inspires us to um, live our full potential. And um, I would never, um, be succeeding the way I am if I didn't have Zara and AHO and my peers behind me. Thank you. 
Uh, Jessica, opportunities for youth to participate in the process? Yeah, so um, when I met Zara and realized that she gives youth all of these leadership opportunities and doesn't just take care of them, but helps them take care of themselves, I knew it was an organization I would want to work with. Um, I feel like AHO is a model um, for a philosophy that I'm really passionate about, which is youth development. Um, the wellness centers that we're building in the schools, one of our main um, core values is youth development because we believe in um, young people sharing their voice and becoming leaders in the process. And I'd love seeing what you guys have done um, from your own experience. I think people can become leaders who didn't expect to be leaders. Um, in our schools right now, we're creating student councils, the wellness student councils, and we're not just looking for the natural leaders to be a part of our councils, but we're actually looking for students with mental health issues or health issues or substance abuse issues to be the leaders and it's giving them opportunities to grow um, and to change and um, i feel like without this leadership opportunity that you've put into ho aho um, you're missing a huge piece so like not only do we have housing here but we have leaders here um, so i feel like the youth development model is um, playing out with a aho and i think there are a lot of opportunities for young people who are not typical leaders to become leaders and i feel very passionate about that opportunity and senator how can youth have a voice in, in policy thank you uh, obviously it starts with aho here locally uh, being able to advocate in our communities and with our local leaders. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple examples of where, whether it's uh, homeless youth or foster, foster youth, have made laws here in California. What we know is that many foster youth, if they, after they age out of the foster care system, at times become homeless. And what we also know is that foster youth are over-medicated with mind-numbing psychotropic medication uh, to be able to essentially tame their behavior. Um, and we were able to pass the strongest bill in America to take away a doctor's medical license last year, uh, take away a doctor's license who's proven to be a serial overprescriber of psychotropic medications to foster youth because literally dozens of foster youth flooded every committee hearing in the state senate and the state assembly demanding justice and the governor signed the bill. And now, if a doctor is proven to be a serial prescri overprescriber, we will take his or her license away and they can never pr practice medicine here in California again. And it's because youth across the state had a voice. And again, they demanded justice. And the second example is the No Place Like Home initiative that was passed two years ago. For the first time in our state's history, we're gonna have $2 billion to be able to build 14,000 permanent supportive housing units for chronic homeless residents in California. Each unit will be wrapped with drug and alcohol addiction counseling as well as mental health services. The reason why that is so important, chronic homeless residents cost taxpayers $100,000 a year. Unreimbursed stays in the emergency room, stays in county jail, and runs with the law. I have drug addiction issues in my family, my brother-in-law. He was addicted to methamphetamine for 10 years. He was in and out of jail. There is no way in hell that we are going to solve the opioid district in the state, or the opioid crisis in the state, or our methamphetamine crisis in our state by simply locking folks up. Uh, and what we need to be able to do is provide permanent support of housing to those who are homeless. And youth homeless came from across this state, again, flooding hearing rooms. And we are able to get tens of millions of dollars to be able to build hundreds of units for uh, youth homeless in this state because they demanded a seat at the table. And that's what we need more of now, more than ever. Uh, and I gotta say, you talk about the best advocates. The best advocates are those three that are to our left. Uh, they are amazing leaders. And I gotta say, so grateful for your incredible work and you are truly changing lives because you have stepped out here tonight. Just want to say thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Well, at this point, we are going to open up to questions from the audience. And we've got this stationary microphone here. And if people who have questions, please come up to the microphone. We've got 
A good 15 minutes or even more of question time. So please don't be shy. Um, we're very lucky to have this wonderful group of panelists here tonight. First off, thank you all for your share because I know it's hard and I appreciate that. And Mike, I wanted to ask you about the $2 billion. Is there a portion of that that is actually going to be applied for youth housing so we know out of the 14,000, 20% or 10% are the restrictions on that? Is it up to the cities? How's that gonna be driven? It's a great question. So what we know right now, out of the two billion in the first year, the County of Marin, starting in 2018, is gonna get $2.1 million starting in January. That's automatic. Um, the funding is flexible. So the County of Marin, or if, let's just say the City of San Rafael can partner with the County of Marin to be able to apply for either chronic homeless housing or housing for homeless youth. It's up to the county and or the city who applies for the dollars. Once the city or county applies for this 2.1 million, and again, it's automatic, they just need to be able to put in the paperwork and the application to be able to secure the dollars and tell the state how they wanna fund, uh, whether it's uh, buying land, the state will fund three things. We'll buy land, we will build, give you the money to build, or let's just say you wanna rehab an apartment building or old hotel, we'll pay for that as well. So each city, county has full flexibility on either chronic homelessness or youth homelessness. 2.1 million is guaranteed for this county in, on January 1st. They can then compete for another 21 million for counties that have a population of approximately 250,000 or less. Marin County is one of the most competitive counties in the state of California. They perform really well. So I encourage working with local stakeholders and leaders to be able to get a hold of those dollars and invest for homeless youth. And we'd be happy to work with you, by the way, on that as well. Hi, I have a question, I think for Zara. Can you explain a little bit more about the housing fund and what the $1,000 a year number kind of reflects and covers? So our housing fund uh, is for youth that are working and going to school that we've known for a while so we can stand behind them when they find a place. Um, uh, that's one way youth uh, find housing with us. Another way is we have host families that offer a room in their home for our youth uh, to be that family that they never had. Uh, a third way is uh, one of our youth um, uh, found housing that has uh, seven other units with it. And he was so amazing um, that the owner made him the manager of the property. And so we know anytime there's a vacancy that we can get our youth into that housing. In fact, Tony is in that housing. So when I saw him that day, it was like I had just gotten a text from Brian, <laughs> said, hey, we have, the, it was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> this is perfect. So that's how Tony got housing in a day <laughs> through AHO. <laughs> Typically, youth are um, uh, checking for housing, maybe wanting to live with a couple of their friends. So we're not making them live with people they don't know. It's all about them. And what, what we require is they stay in communication, keep their word, and show up. That's, that's what we look for, someone we can count on, depend on, um, who is accountable, dependable, and responsible. So that if we connect them and stand behind them by writing a letter to a landlord, we know that it's a good fit. Uh, Brittany, your other question, so how does AHO, okay, uh, we have 99 community partners. I think I mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, so the, uh, 
youth that we help um, get comprehensive support, regardless. Uh, eyeglasses. Uh, Juliana is the beneficiary of that. So was Christina. Uh, also, the, the dental. Uh, Christina said after being to our amazing dentist, who's young like Senator, <laughs> uh, which is really nice, um, that it was like a vacation going to the dentist. You know, they get in right away. They have someone that really cares. In fact, uh, the dentist um, uh, that launched with us the first free dental clinic for major and minor dental work for our youth is the son of my dentist from about 30 years. And they have been traveling around the world for more than 30 years to low-income communities in South America, Central America, Africa, Asia, offering free dental to those communities. So we have an amazing <laughs> dental team for our youth. So uh, the costs for the, those things are covered through our community partners. What we basically do is broker the service. So for example, when uh, Juliana needed her glasses, um, I, I w went with her to make sure everything worked. Same way with Christina. Uh, they were wanting to give her these tiny little glasses that wouldn't have been a fit. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm, I'm an advocate for them. So um, I hope that helps. The thousand is that youth, um, depending uh, on what the situation is. So the, you know, the thousand could be uh, a thousand for two or three youth. So it becomes three thousand, but it's three different youth that we're we're helping. I don't know if I made that clear. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Lori Fregoli, and I'm a 27-year veteran of the district attorney's office as a prosecutor. And um, I'm running for district attorney. My platform is connecting the community to the courthouse because we work for you. We serve you. And Zara, you have such vision and commitment um, I honor you for that, and um, I hope I get to work with you in the future, no matter what happens. You have, you are so far ahead of everybody I can imagine. Um, I was at the forum on human trafficking, and I think it is an important factor to drive home that when young men and women are homeless, they are at great risk to be victims of human trafficking, and I think that's a big piece of the issue here that I appreciate you were at that forum on Friday and I appreciate your continuing work. Um, Senator, I commit to you that um, we will try and get every dollar we can from that money. I know Sonoma County just got some money on a grant for homeless youth and also for adults, but specifically for youth and um, we need to work on that and partner with everybody that we can and I commit to do that. Um, but the third thing I want to say for Christina and Tony, it sounds like the system really failed you, both as adults and juveniles, and um, I want to know if you specifically had maybe just one or two quick comments that since you went through the system and are now on the other side of it, if you were to go back in time, what could we have done better for you, both in the juvenile system and as an adult, that we could maybe take home as a takeaway from this platform tonight. So maybe that's Tony shaking his head, like maybe that's too big of a question. So go ahead. Um, I want to say more work with the family. Um, I think at the time um, there were a lot of fingers being pointed, um, both my family and, you know, I just, I had a lot going on. There were definitely a lot of adults uh, surrounding me, but um, the interest wasn't, it wasn't really 
trying to, you know, find the actual problem. It was just, you know, you're not staying in school, you're not following these rules, but, you know, no one was looking into what was going on at home, and um, that's where everything happened. So um, I think if maybe we paid more attention to what's going on in the home, we can, if we paid more attention to what's going on in the home at a young age, um, I think we could prevent a lot of this from happening. Um, you know, I, I did have some support, but I think um, I needed it a lot sooner. So maybe more attention to behaviors, you know, at school may have been helpful as well. Uh, so um, what could be done differently if I was to go back in time? Was that the question? How could you have helped differently? How could the district attorneys? Well, um, I, I had a, my, I found my dad dead in November of 2015, and I was living in the house, and um, I was of no <laughs> shape to be taking care of myself, let alone a house or anything else. Um, and uh, I, uh, so my experience with the law um, is that I, I've, I've called in, um, and asked for help, and I've, uh, I've asked for, for people to be escorted or taken off of the property I was staying at, and in turn, I was told to calm down and stuff, and then um, uh, judicial system, the system, okay, how about this? Because um, I could go on and on about, yeah, it is a large question um, that I could talk for a long time on. But when I went to jail in September of last year, um, I struggled to the very day that I was sentenced um, with representation or any kind of knowledge. Like, I was writing letters to the judge, to the district attorney's office, and the public defender's office, and I didn't get any response in all three cases. Um, the men that were incarcerated with me did far more for me than a public defender's office, district attorney's office, or the judge. Um, so in that and through that, I found God once again, and also that um, education. Um, because there's a, I, I got to witness too, because I kept showing up for court and getting these continuations week on, week on, week on, week on. And I would see, I'd see young men in there, and then um, I wouldn't see them for a while, and then a couple months later I'd see them again, but they had been released and came back, and they caught a similar charge that they had caught before. But um, they were now looking at a, a time with a suspended sentence that they accepted from the time before. So now they were looking at double time, triple time, state penitentiary. Um, uh, the major these men didn't, <laughs> they didn't know what they were saying yes to. Like, uh, um, district attorney's office tried giving me a, a great bodily injury. Um, there was no proof on that. Uh, when I sat down at my preliminary hearing, I was given my discovery when I requested it weeks before. Um, uh, two cops on stand lied under oath about um, me committing a crime that I never did. Um, there's no medical records or anything to prove for their favor. Um, so something that could be done today, based on my experience then, would be to ask those cops what they were doing lying on stand, trying to put me away to three to five years. I think you'd be a great advocate and maybe you should consider a law school. <laughs> <laughs> Before I ask my question, let me just say that um, I was really moved by your stories, and thank you so much for sharing those. I can't imagine how difficult it is to stand before a group of people and talk openly about your experiences. Um, my question is really to the senator, and I'm sorry, I can't read your name from here, the Jessica, thanks. So I'm actually, I'm on the board of a national organization that serves homeless youth. Um, we have, it's called Stand Up for Kids, and we have, um, operations in 10 states, and it's 17 operations in 10 states. And one of the things, I've just joined the board recently, I'm very passionate about um, 
serving homeless youth. One of the things that really strikes me is that there are a lot of different organizations that are concerned about doing work to support homeless youth, but they're all doing it um, all over the place. And I just wonder if you could speak to would there be benefit? Is there a way to, and is there, would there be a benefit to try to bring these organizations together so that they're working together towards the same end? Um, Hi, I would say absolutely. So um, it's really complicated to figure out what the best resource is for each young person. And um, I, at this point, I work with Zara. You know, she's, she's my person, but I know there's many other resources out there. And I feel like that happens a lot in the government and nonprofit world, that a lot of people are doing the same thing. Um, and first of all, we should all be creating programs that complement each other. We shouldn't be duplicating necessarily unless we need to do that. And I know that my experience in Marin, I haven't found very many resources for homeless youth. So um, if I knew that there were more, I would certainly work to access them and kind of figure out what each group can offer. Um, but yes, we should all be supporting each other and working together. That's the best way to support young people. Um, and that is the best way to help our young people figure out how to navigate in the world. So we don't want them to become completely dependent on one person or one program, but we want them to be able to navigate um, the systems themselves. And as of now, I, I personally don't know very much about all of the different organizations um, that are available. Um, they don't do the outreach or the information is not readily available. So I think that would be incredibly beneficial. Thank you for the question. Um, I think one of the biggest frustrations that I have is that in many cases, unless you have an individual that's passionate about it, homeless youth don't have a lobbyist. Uh, and you know, lobbyists can cost 10 to 25,000 a month. And so there are, there's an organization that does fantastic work called the California Coalition for Youth. Um, it's the body of homeless youth organizations from across the state. They convene once a year. They have a, um, an annual conference. Would love to be able to connect you with them. Uh, they operate uh, as many youth homeless youth organizations do on a shoestring. But we're talking significant difference can be made with very few dollars. California, up until last year, was spending less than $2 million a year on homeless youth services. This is the first year we actually hit $25 million statewide, and we're approaching 40 million people in the state. So um, the other, I think the biggest push that we need right now is a homeless youth plan for the state of California. Basic level of services, uh, when it comes to mental health and drug and alcohol addiction, uh, when it comes to sexual abuse, we need to be f focusing more and investing more in human trafficking because there is an absolute connection between those youth who are homeless and being uh, trafficked. Um, but we don't even have a homeless youth plan. Um, so that's, and as we heard, two-thirds of counties don't have shelters and 50% don't even offer any type of service. The state of California needs to advance a baseline of services that should be offered in all 58 counties. Uh, and to be able to do that, we need a long-term plan. Would love to be able to work with you on that. We believe that a statewide plan would only cost between five and seven and a half million bucks, one time. Uh, and when we have uh, a budget that is approaching 250 billion, it's small dollars. Good evening. My name is George Landau, and uh, I'm the Rotarian that uh, Julia talked about. And if any of you here are members of any kind of an organization that needs speakers, I highly recommend that you book Zara and one of her disciples to come <laughs> and spend a half an hour in 20 minutes. They will get your, your uh, whoever you got in the room really informed and enthusiastic and supportive. And I can say that because uh, we've done it. Uh, my, so that's a testimonial. But my observation for you, Senator, is this. I, I am a member of the faith community in Marin County. And on the subject of homelessness, uh, we have had money and we've had land and we've had 
an opportunity to build on it until such time that we presented the project and not in my backyard showed up in droves. So, uh, and we were basically pushed out of standing room only meeting at the San Rafael uh, Town Council. So my suggestion is, if at all possible, that you write into the uh, budget that people who know that what they're doing on a local uh, discrete basis, such as Zara, who places people in homes that all over where they don't, when it's not considered shelter, <laughs> because the shelter comes with it, all kinds of you know, adjectives, baggage, and that you separate the housing from all the other facilities, because the communities do accept the dental clinics and the, you know, the urine testing and whatever else needs to be done on a general basis, but they just will not, at least I'm talking about Marin, uh, it's an uphill battle to get a community to uh, enable a facility to be built. So that's just a suggestion for you. If you could separate it, it will work. If not, the money will be there and it, and it won't be used properly. Thank you. I'll make it 60 seconds or less. I, I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the biggest battles in the North Bay and throughout the Bay Area is doing what is right when there is so much neighborhood opposition. Every data point shows when you provide a resident a home, we can solve homelessness. Utah, over the last 14 years, has taken 40% of the chronic homeless population off of the street. They're now saving 30% of their overall budget. But it's gonna take all of us having a backbone to be able to flood those city council chambers, demand our local reps, candidly, to do what's right. Do what's right when it comes to policy and what's right for our neighbors. And that's what it's gonna come down to, and I think you, you hit the nail on the head. We know what we need to do. It's now time to get a backbone and do it. Okay, uh, my name is Jonathan Freeman, and uh, I've been doing work on homelessness off and on for uh, about 20 years in the community, and um, uh, I was actually on Azara's board when she started in uh, 2004, and helped her out when through some difficulties, and uh, Lately, my work has been centered around youth homelessness, and particularly in the area of youth involvement in, uh, in the sex trade. But before I go on to that, I just wanted to make sure that uh, Laura Fogoli announced that she was running for DA. And I don't think you ought to be doing your campaigning here. It's not your platform for that. And for that matter, I'd like to announce that Anna Pletcher is running for DA. The second thing, what's that? Keep it focused on our that's right. That's what I wanted to do. The second thing is that I wanted people to under. Uh, I've been in philanthropy for about 20 years or so. Been on foundations, help give away millions of bucks, raise millions of bucks, and overall, what we find is that the people who that I've talked to who are doing the helping are women. And look what we have here is a room full of women. The caring part of our our uh, species. They're supportive, they're maternal, and I think that you all uh, should note that, that that is the case. So, um, and those of us men who are here, because we have a strong feminist side. <laughs> the, uh, I'm gonna get back to the issue of, of, the, uh, of the study that was done in six cities across the nation. New York, Atlantic City, Miami, Chicago, Dallas, and here in the Bay Area. 
and it focused on youth involvement in the sex trade, and it found several things. One, it backed up every one of your stories. Access to services was lost. There were runaways. You were pushed out of home for a variety of reasons. That's what led to your homeless, and this is what the study found. The other thing that the study found was that if you had 100 kids who were in the sex trade, almost 90 of them would be on their own. So the narrative about human trafficking being an epidemic is not true. There's a very small percentage of the people who are coerced into doing sex work. And you know, there are about, oh, I'd say about 15% of the kids, or anybody in the sex trade for that matter, who has a collaborative or a third party uh, market facilitator. Some people might call them pimps, probably not. There are people who help them. The thing that, uh, there was a book that was published about a year and a half ago by Alex Slotnick. She has crossed the bay, she's done a lot of research, and the book is called Domestic Minor Sex Trafficking, Beyond Victims and, vi vi Beyond Victims and, and vi Villains. And she pointed out that, not only as you, Jessica, pointed out, the kids who are being so resourceful without a roof on their heads, have a kind of onslaught of being bereft, are being so resourceful. Some of them resort to survival sex. And it's, I don't know what proportion it is, but some of the studies, for example, in Las Vegas, I just spoke to the woman who ran the study there. They interviewed 100 kids, only about 20 of them were below 18. But uh, the studies have been done that show that the kids are really resourceful and actually quite strong in being able to try to take care of themselves. And so I gotta hand it to you guys, no matter what. I mean, the whole point of being, of when you're without a home and without parents, even when I was in the home and I was being neglected, I wasn't out on the streets, I know what, it, it, it feels awful. It must have felt awful. So I just want to put those uh, comments out there and, and say uh, I'm so glad that everybody's here tonight because this issue is, is so needful and necessary to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In, in the time that we have remaining, we would like to break out into groups so that we could focus on solutions. And Senator, did you have some thoughts for how we could? Anna, let me just speak to that, oh. what Jonathan just said. Oh, actually, I'm going to. Are you going to speak to it? No, I'm actually going <laughs> to okay. move us on. And if this, is, this is Laurel Bosford. She is a, a, a expert on sex trafficking and works with Shared Hope International. And please, just she would be quick, quick happy response. to follow up with you afterwards with more <laughs> details. <laughs> on sex trafficking in Marin and the connection with homelessness. But we do need to move on because we only have 20 minutes left and these breakout groups are a really important part of our uh, program tonight. Um, Senator, do you have a few words to wrap up and move us on? Absolutely. So again, uh, this is gonna be the most important part of tonight. So what we heard here towards the end is, how are we gonna be able to drive solutions here at home? And the only way that we're gonna be able to do that is organizing and executing a plan, which is this last portion of tonight's meeting. So I wanna take a moment again to be able to say thank you to the youth who not only organized uh, tonight's forum, but led it. Let's give them a round of applause. And we would be remiss without saying thank you to AHO and Zara. There are very few people in life that dedicate their personal life and their career to an issue as important as this. And that is the woman to my right. And again, Zara, thank you for your incredible work, truly. Um, you know, Senator, I just feel totally blessed to be doing what I'm doing. I'm the lucky one. I'm meeting these amazing young people who, when they come to AHO, I know they have uh, needs, and certainly we help with that, kind of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, uh, safety and security as the bottom rung, 
Uh, the AHO motto in the middle is about recognition. That's why they're out there speaking and sharing their stories. And the very top of the Maslow Triangle is self-actualization, which is what tonight is about. They create programs, uh, they inspire other youth to get involved, and the community. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. And also want to say thank you to Jessica, because she is leading the change at Tamil Pius, making them a model school district in the state of California. So thank you so much as well. So what we, we heard from the youth tonight about their personal experiences. We heard about reasons for youth homelessness, the barriers to be able to break the cycle. We heard about what happens if we don't act. We also heard about solutions. But really the solutions are all of you. You are the solution to be able to break the cycle of youth homelessness. And we need your help right now. And I know that you are hit up a lot. Life is busy. But there are very few issues that can change a life like breaking the cycle of youth homelessness. We need you to be with us right now. We need you to be with the youth. It's our turn to be able to organize. You will see two poster boards on easels on the left side of the room, my left. You will see two additional poster boards on the right side of the room. We're gonna get into breakout groups. We're gonna have individuals who will be leading these groups. We ask you to be able to go to the breakout group that most interests you. School outreach, I'm gonna ask um, Carol to be able to, let's figure out where school outreach is. And I'm gonna have you take a look on that side. So school outreach, which one is school outreach, right? Yeah. All right, school outreach is gonna be meeting right here. With school outreach, if you're interested to be able to um, work with AHO on reaching out to schools so that we make having health, mental health, and sexual health services the norm uh, at each of our school districts, you're gonna wanna be able to go there. Our next one is gonna be working with the businesses uh, in our faith community to be able to get them involved. Let's figure out, since uh, right over here, look at that, we have uh, a lot of folks helping, thank you. So right over here in the front, if you wanna be able to figure out how we can organize our business community and our faith community to be able to break the cycle of youth homelessness in Marin County, you're gonna to come to the first poster board to the right. If you wanna be able to get directly involved with AHO, let's figure out which one that is. I'm guessing it may be right over here. Am I right? Someone help me. Hey, there we go. All right. AHO needs your help. They are a grassroots organization. They are a grassroots organization that's making a difference every day in the lives of the most vulnerable youth in our, in our community. If you're interested in getting involved with AHO tonight, you're gonna to go to the second uh, poster board to my left. And then finally, if you are interested in making a difference within your community, our county, you're going to go to this fourth poster board, the second on my right. We need all of you to help organize when projects come forward, like permanent housing, whether it's here in San Rafael or in San Anselmo, that we get those council chambers packed to make sure that we get these projects passed. So if you're interested in helping us organize when it comes to city and county, we, we ask you to please come forward the second to the right. All right, so what's gonna happen is we're gonna break for about 10 minutes. We're gonna bar the doors uh, so you cannot get out. I'm kidding. But we truly, this is the most important part of this evening. So please go to school outreach business or faith community outreach. If you want to get involved with AHO, head on over there or organize in your city or town, organize right over here. We're going to come back together for final words in approximately 10 minutes. Let's go. Let's get this organized and let's break the cycle of youth homelessness in the county of Marin. 